Well, it is great to see you guys, and uh, it is really good to be here today. As executive director, I get to go to a bunch of toolbox lunches every month. And I will tell you, it really is different to show up as the speaker. <laughs> and I thought about it walking in here today. I thought, okay, toolbox downtown. This fall, we've had uh, a race car driver, a, a professor of nanotechnology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, we've had uh, a guy who was an FBI informant for three years. And, and, and then me. So, uh, <laughs> wow, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and have the chance to do this, but uh, uh, it might be important for me to remember uh, what it feels like to, to be the guy who shows up as a speaker, because it, do, it does feel different, and it feels like a, a privilege, but it feels like responsibility, too. So, anyhow, uh, a lot of you guys are probably here because somebody invited you, uh, maybe recently, like inviting you for today in particular, or, or maybe sometime earlier, somebody invited you to a different toolbox lunch. Either way, I just got to tell you, if you came here at some point in time because you were invited, I just love it because it's crazy uh, what can happen with something as simple as an invitation. In fact, uh, years ago, somebody invited me into a setting that was pretty similar to this. And it actually ended up being uh, one of the defining moments in my life. Back then, I was actually in, in high school, and I'd moved to Houston uh, just a couple years prior from the Midwest. And it was, a, this is 19, like, 73. It was a significant cultural shift to come in. And uh, a couple years into my time here, man, I had still not found my group. I don't know if you can remember what it's like to be 15 or 16 years old and have not found your group, but it's a little like not having a liver. You know, it's kind of it's kind of desperate feeling. And uh, by my count, I was one of the more miserable people that I knew. And I, granted, I was comparing my insides to everybody else's outsides, so it might not have been a mountaintop experience for them either. Uh, but I'm telling you, at that point in my time, I was not a happy camper. I was bored out of my gourd. I was lonely. I would have done anything to try to fit in with anybody. And I was actually failing miserably at all of it, honestly. Right. So then a guy named Jerry Schroff, I bet there's somebody in the room that actually knows him, but a guy named Jerry Schroff invited me to go to a, a Bible study. And I had never been and actually had never wanted uh, to go to a Bible study at that point in my life, but actually I was so bored <laughs> that I said yes. And uh, I said yes, even though at that point in my life I was very uh, anti-religious. I'll just put it that way. Anti-religious. It, it wasn't like I had uh, deep philosophical resistance or had uh, intellectual opposition to, to things of faith. That's not, that's not really how I rolled. You know, I, I just didn't like it. Uh, you know, to that point in time, church was the only and a sort of occasional exposure to have anything of faith. And to my counting at that point in time, it was boring. Uh, you had to get dressed up to go. You had to hang your clothes up when you got home. And to prove that I was really one of the smart kids, uh, back in those days, the only time professional wrestling was on TV was Sunday morning. <laughs> And that really, anybody remember that? It was, it was professional wrestling, Sunday morning, act, professional wrestling and roller derby on Sunday morning. It was like the early and the late service back in the, in the 70s. And uh, I, I, just, it, I just didn't like any of what I experienced. It, it seemed, to me, it seemed irrelevant. It seemed soft. And I just didn't want anything to do with it. But uh, I said yes to Jerry's invitation. And I can remember driving over to it. He drove like an old 
like an Oldsmobile 98 or something like a land yacht, you know, and it was big and the front seat was like a couch and the thing would kind of, kind of flow smoothly down the road. It was a smooth ride, but driving over there, I can remember being nervous as a cat. I had no idea what that was going to be like. I was, I was really nervous. Well, it turned out, uh, uh, to be a Young Life gathering, and if you're not familiar with Young Life, it's an outreach to high schoolers, and it's a ton of fun, but it's got a definite Christ-centered faith base to it. And I can, I can remember clear as this day, walking into this room of like 300 students, and experienced a kind of acceptance there that night that was, that was really powerful. I don't, I don't know if this makes sense but it was kind of like there was oxygen in that room that I needed to breathe, you know? And I can remember leaving there that night, saying to myself, I have no idea what the guy up front's talking about, <laughs> but I love being here and I'm gonna come back, you know? And, and so I tell you that today in hopes that even if you leave here today and you say, I have no idea what that guy up front was talking about, I hope you'll at least say, man, I love being there, and I'm going to come back. And I really do hope for here and like every, every toolbox lunch we have that you go, there's, there's like an oxygen in the room uh, that I need to breathe. So I'm going to tell you, I, I, I kept coming back. Here's, here's the beauty of coming back to, to that which I was, I was uh, invited to. I, I kept coming back, and I don't know if this will make sense to you, but it, it was like... Uh, it's like God began to woo me to himself. You know, this, this group, if you're not familiar with it, it's not like in your face. It's not like come to the front. It's not like make a decision today, get with it. You know, it's a bit, they just come alongside you. They know you. They love you. They accept you where you're at. They show up at stuff you do. They're interested in your life, you know, and, and that's, that's what I, I, I begin to experience. I, I show up, and every week I start hearing these uh, uh, Jesus stories, and I discovered that he, Jesus, was, was actually really different than I had perceived. You know, I started hearing stories like uh, of this amazing courage where he would like stand up to the religious elite and he would look at him and he'd say stuff like, every time you make a convert, you make him twice the son of hell as yourself. I'm like, yeah, that had a little... Sunday morning wrestling smack to it. Oh, that's pretty good. You know, or, or he had this sort of daring kind of compassion and, and that would, that with other places where that people would uh, avoid people and places, you know, he would, he would enter in. I started hearing him about like he putting hands on a leper. You know, when everybody else would just stay as far away from him as they could. Or that story about Jesus crossing some humongous, like, cultural boundaries to go and have a drink of water with a Samaritan woman who was, like, metaphorically dying of thirst. And, and so he, he, he crosses his, his boundary and, and enters in. And I was hearing these stories, and it, it really was just like, I just kept showing up. And as I was showing up, it's like God was just, like, wooing me to himself, like, you know, slowly. Some of my perceptions and my preconceptions are just kind of melting away, you know? And somewhere along the line, you know, I, I think I began to hear about Jesus dying on the cross. I think I knew that he had done that, but I really don't think I had any idea what that was all about. You know, but I was in this setting where someone, you just telling stories, and I begin to understand the way it kind of was described as like my life had like missed the mark, like shooting an arrow and missing the bullseye. And they said, that, that's, that's, that's sin, you know, and the, the ways you've fallen short of God's design, you, you, you've missed the mark, and, and because of that, you're separated from God. And, and then what Jesus really came to do was to, to remedy that so that I could, that I could have a, a relationship with God. I, I, you probably heard some story it kind of like this one that kind of helped it make sense a little bit. It's like saying, uh, you know, to Dwight, you know, Dwight, imagine just for a second, you got terminal cancer and, and then I'm 100% absolutely healthy. 
He said, okay, so what's going to happen to you? And, you know, Dwight said, well, I'm going to die. What's going to happen to me? Well, I'm going to live. But imagine just for a moment that I was able to reach into Dwight's life and gather up every one of those alien killer cells and pull them out of him and put them all in me. What's going to happen to me? I'm going to die. What's going to happen to Dwight? He's going to live. And so all of a sudden I begin to understand that, that this is exactly what Jesus came to do, not with cancer cells, but, but with, with that, the ways I had fallen short that separated me from God. And that he didn't come just to demonstrate a different kind of life. Gosh, he came to be the source of a different kind of life. You know, it, it's what he described actually as an as abundant life. I can remember he's like, you know, I've come that you might have a life and, and, and might have it abundantly. So I tell you all that, that uh, when, when that reality, when that reality, when I came to kind of understand that truth of who Jesus was and what he did, right, and, and believe it, uh, I was transformed. <laughs> you know, I really, this is me looking at me. But I, I really went from being one of the more miserable people I knew, as I described to you, to actually becoming one of the more authentically joyful people I, I had known. And, and that reality, like, it launched me, you know? In fact, I'm not really sure launch is exactly the right, the right word. Uh, it did launch me. I mean, there was, there, there was this impetus, you know, in, in my life, like, like a, a launch. But <laughs> a launch sounds very definitive, doesn't it? It's like very straight, and it, it doesn't waver. And, and uh, that, that definitely wasn't <laughs> the, the case for me. There was a whole lot of wavering. There was a whole lot of uh, wandering and that, those kind of things. But, but there was something in, the, new that started in my life. In fact, maybe, maybe a better way to describe what happened in, in, in that place would uh, be, come from like one of the more famous like, places in the Bible. And even if you've never like, read the Bible, you might have seen this on a Hallmark card or something, where in, in, in Psalm 23, it, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, right? Now, now, the idea of God being a shepherd, that's kind of a foreign concept to us because not many of us make our living as shepherds uh, today. Uh, but at that point in time, it would have been like one of the most graphic ways that God could have used to describe the way that he'll enter into somebody's life. Yeah. Right? And, and, and that's what began to happen to me. You know, when he, when he says he, was, he would be a shepherd, it means he's going to guide, he's going to protect, he's, he's going to provide. And I'm telling you, I began to experience all of that. You know, God began to lead me and protect me and protect me from me. And he's continued to do that, you know, even to today, protecting me from me and correcting me. He's broken me. You know, there's this story about shepherds and one of the things they used to do for, for sheep that would wander off and say, they, I don't know if it's totally true, but the, the, shepherd, the shepherd would grab the sheep and they'd break their leg and throw them over their shoulders and carry them for a while. So when they put them back down, that sheep would know he needed need to, to stake close. And, you know, I saw him work in all those, uh, all those ways. And you know what the cool thing is? Every bit of that, for me, a lifetime journey flowed from one invitation. Somebody said, hey, why don't you come with me to this thing? And it caught me at a moment where I said, well, I'm so bored. Okay. And, and it really, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's defined my life. You know, Dwight kind of gave you my uh, background and the things I've done professionally, if you will, uh, you know, over the years before I was a part of Toolbox. So I'm gonna, in the remainder of the time, I want to talk about two things today and uh, uh, beyond what, I, what I've just told you. And uh, uh, one of those is I, I'm going to fast forward through a big chunk of my personal story uh, to kind of focus in on some lessons that uh, that I learned and learns a just, 
I don't really love the word learned because it sounds so complete and final, doesn't it? Like, oh, I got that one, you know. But uh, some lessons that I've learned uh, in especially going through uh, a career in life transition, pretty significant one, is a few years back. And uh, I think I described it in some of the emails coming out. That it, it, was, it was maybe one of the most taxing, but at the same time one of the most life-giving uh, seasons of my life and some things I've learned in that. And I'm just going to kind of share a couple of those things and how that unfolded. And in particular, because it, it was some of those things that actually brought me to Toolbox and, and the ways that, that God met me in that season, the way that He showed up in that season in, in my life. Gosh, it's so close to the heart of what Toolbox is about. And it, frankly, it's my longing of my heart for every guy in this room. And a lot of them who haven't made it in the room yet. You know, so, so, so that's what I'd, I'd take a couple minutes on now. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned it in my email, but I worked at the same place. Dwight said it just a second ago. I worked at the same place for a really long time. You know, I got out of A&M. I spent about two years. I was an animal science and biomedical science major. And, man, if ever there was a person uh, misplaced in what he studied, that probably would have been me. But I got out of A&M, and I spent... Uh, two or three years working in a cancer research facility here in Houston. And, uh, but that launch pad that had already happened in my life started just began to prevail. And I went back to school to get sort of refashioned, actually to go to work for Young Life. Uh, and in, the, in the end, uh, what, what happened was I ended up going to work for a church, a place called Spring Branch Community Church. I came there as, as an intern and in the summer of 1988, and uh, my internship ended in February of 2020. So I was there for, <laughs> I was, I was there for uh, 31 years, about roughly, this isn't the exact math, but roughly 10 years, you know, working with teenagers, and about 20 years uh, as, a, as, a, as a senior pastor there. In fact, Jeff Smith right here, he was like, this guy right here, he was like one of the, he was the first volunteer I had when I, started working with teenagers over there and uh, you have to ask him the story afterwards but he has a famous story about him asking me about what we're going to do and i said i have no idea <laughs> so it really i the gift of inspiring confidence has been a long-term <laughs> gift so but i had an incredible time there i really did we had great experiences and wonderful wonderful opportunities you know uh this, this gracious group of people just kept opening up doors uh, for me to, to do different things and to serve in different ways, even though uh, you know, I didn't really have experience that such things might require. And I got to do stuff I never dreamed I'd get to. You know, we, uh, we moved to church, which is a, it was a huge thing. I got to take kind of a risk-averse group of people and, and take a huge step. We built a new place. I got to learn about like, like some of y'all's world, like architecture and real estate and development. And it was finance, stuff that I didn't even know about. So it was really, really a, a, a tremendous uh, kind of experience. It really was. But uh, there's a million chapters in there. You know, I'm married in the midst of that. We have four children. Uh, now our children are grown. Uh, I have one who's here today somewhere. Uh, there, my son Joel's back there, you know, and uh, so we got, there's chapters and chapters of, of things we could go into. I'm not going to go into all those today. I'm going to fast forward to, you know, about six years ago. And uh, so that would have been like my 28th year there overall. That would have been like my 18th year in the lead pastor role. And uh, Dwight gave the favorable version, thank you for that, uh, of what happened. And, and I really do believe that was part of it. Uh, how and why I stepped down. But uh, the more I've been gone from that, I, I begin to realize a little bit more about my life and, and, uh, and watching it. And 28 years in, 18 in the lead role, and I was stinking out of gas, is <laughs> the reality. I, I was just, uh, you guys have probably been there, maybe you have. I was out of gas, I was burned out. And I didn't use those words, and I, frankly, I wouldn't use those words. Uh, you know, and ultimately, I think it was, prob it was pride. But I got to the place where, you know, you probably have a central role in your job. Like there's something that's like, it's what you do, you know. And I got to I could, I couldn't prepare for Sunday mornings. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get there, you know. And, and I was dutifully going about all the other things I had to do. And, 
and pretty agreeable, I think, but inside there was, I was getting to the place where actually I was, I was uh, resenting a bunch of it. I was in a deep hole, you know, my, and my wife, boy, she, she beautifully said, she said, you know, I think you like need medication. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I kind of feel like that would be cheating. And she said, well, you're not exactly winning. <laughs> so, no, said, okay. So it was, it, it, was, it was a hard place. It was a, it was a, it was a difficult place. And so, so uh, um, you know, as, as Wright mentioned, I went to the leaders of our church, and, and I said, okay, I think maybe I was supposed to step down, and this is the way I put it, and put the baton in a younger man's hand for the next season of Bridgepoint's life. Right? That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds very noble. And, and I think I meant it. I really do think I meant it. In retrospect, looking back, you know, I, I didn't have any other way to frame it, but, but I, I was just too pr proud uh, to say what was really going on and say, I, man, I need somebody to enter in and, and, and do something different. So, you know, I, I went to our, our, our leaders, and, and I'd been there a long time, and these guys were my friends, you know, and they said, well, if you step down, we want you to stay and do something else. I'm like, that would be so weird. I mean, you guys, you guys know leadership transition in your world. It, it would just be so weird for the old guy to step down but stay around and, and to bring a new guy in. I'm, re I'm really not interested in that. And we, we talked and we prayed about for a long time about whether you know, that was going to be what, what I would do or not. And finally, I concluded that I was supposed to step down, but I had not leaned in on that step down but stay around uh, part of it. But I, I did, you know, and this may sound weird to you, I don't know, but I did have this like hand to God moment at the end of it where I, I knew that I knew that I knew that even though I was stepping down, I was supposed to stay around. I mean, no longer was an, it an idea. It was, it was now, it was an obedience. Like, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it at all, right? But at that point in time, I, I knew that I was uh, supposed to, and it was like this obedience. See, and, and this is that shepherd thing I, I was talking about a minute ago. I wanted to run, right? I wanted to run. And uh, God wouldn't let me. It, it, that's kind of what shepherds do, right? He may stick around, all right? So we went out, and we searched for, and we hired a new young guy to take my place. Wow, almost 30, almost 30 years younger than me, okay? Great guy. Oh, my gosh. Smart, godly, disciplined, intentional. Man, great. He, he comes on staff, and, and he started doing exactly what he should do, which is evaluating everything in the life of the church, right? Uh, only problem is I'd been there long enough that I had fingerprints on almost everything <laughs> that was around us. So just kind of think about that for a second. You, you, you're there when your predecessor is, uh, yeah, I mean, your successor is uh, evaluating where you've invested your life. And I, he, he's great. He didn't do anything wrong. Wow, that was hard. That was really hard. Okay. And then on top of that, right about that time, Hurricane Harvey hit. Okay, our church is like Eldridge at I-10, uh, otherwise known as Epicenter. Okay, that's where, that's where the levees open up and it all happens. And, and, and the place flooded and the church was wiped out. And suddenly we became a church that met in a school and had to set up and tear down. And we had tons of people who lost everything. And like you guys know, we're helping them. We're built, rebuilding the campus. And, and so uh, it, it, was, it was hard, you know, it was just so hard. And I look back on myself. I, and I, not that you're all that interested in, in the church world, but maybe you, you can relate to this. Uh, I, during that season, I absolutely felt like an animal who was caught in a trap. And if I could have chewed my arm off to get out of there, I would have. I, kn I knew I wasn't free to, so I didn't, but uh, I wanted out, but the shepherd wouldn't let me go. Uh, he uh, loved me too much. And one thing he needs to do is it bring me to the end of myself. Right? So there's this, there's this verse uh, in the Bible. It comes up in, in the book of 1 Peter and in James. And it says this. 
that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Right? You know, and, and God was humbling me uh, he, he, so that his grace, and by that I don't mean just his grace of, of forgiveness, but his grace of extending his power and his life into my life. God was humbling so, so his grace, his power, and his life could flow in, in my life in a new way. Right? So, so here's, the, how, here's how I, I picture this. I, I'd like you to imagine just for a moment that there's this reservoir, like a, a lake reservoir. And it's wide and it's deep and it's filled with crystal clear blue water as far as you can see. It's refreshing and it's alive and everywhere. And that reservoir sort of like represents the person and the provisions of God. Okay? Got the picture? But then coming, coming out of that reservoir, there's a, there's a riverbed. And like that riverbed represents, in this picture, my life. And you look over at that riverbed at that point in time, and you look at it, and you go, wow, it is dry and dusty and overgrown. And you go, wait, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. For the reservoir to be so full, and you've got this river that's connected, yet it's so empty. But then you, you follow the riverbed up to where they connect, with the reservoir and the riverbed, and, and you get that place and you look, and there's locks in a dam. And, and all of a sudden, you realize that the, the locks in the dam uh, open and close like on the basis of pride and humility. Like, you know, pride just kind of closes that down. But says God's opposed by, but he gives grace to the humble. And it's like one of these places where we're, we're humbled or, 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 or walk in a humble way. It's like, it's like the locks open up. And, and you can just imagine what happens when those locks open up, right? It's like the reservoir comes rushing down into the riverbed. And it, and it brings it back to life. You know, and, and uh, that's what God was doing in my life. He, he was keeping me in this place until I'd come to the end of myself and where I could get the place where I would, I would trust him and I would rest in him r rather than running. And I tell you this because I really think if this is a lot of hindsight now, but I really think at that point in time, I probably felt like I was being punished. And now looking back, I'm like, my gosh, I was being rescued. Because <laughs> that's what shepherds do. They like rescue, right? So about that time, you know, like the water flowing down the river, I really began to uh, regain a joy and engagement. And, and I'm, I'm back, I'm still at the church, and I can remember thinking, man, I'm coming back to life, you know? It's, 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 it's something's happening again. And I can remember thinking to myself, okay, okay, if I don't, I'm 31 years, years in at this point, I think, okay, if I don't do something really stupid, they probably let me stay around here the rest of my life, you know? And I think I, think I was kind of okay with that, all right? And, and so it's not too long after that. It was like three years ago this October, I think it was. Uh, but I'm sitting in this board meeting, and I'm not really normally like quite this mystical, but it, I'm sitting in this board meeting, and, and it is like God reached down. I call this my tap on the shoulder. It's like God reached down out of heaven, and, and he likes it, and you're done. <laughs> and I, I kid you not, man. I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh, I'm done. And I went home and told my wife and kind of talked about it, prayed about it that, that night. The next morning... You know, I show up in my office, and I have a standing appointment with the, 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 the lead uh, man who I report to. And he comes to my office. He says, how you doing? I said, I believe I'm done. <laughs> and, and he said, wait, what? <laughs> I believe I'm done. I believe I'm done. It was, that, it was just that clear, you know. And I didn't know to what, and I didn't know to where. But I, I knew I was being launched on an adventure. Right? And I thought, wow. And, and it, was, it was really actually uh, euphoric. Like I had this, 
step of faith to take, and, and I took it. And, and I didn't really understand it all, but about a week later, I'm sitting in, in church, and I'm kind of paying attention to what's going on, you know, and I'm sitting like with everybody else. And, uh, but all of a sudden, I have this thought come to my mind. Was it God? Was it me? I, I don't know, but it came with such force and clarity, I, I wrote it down in my notebook, word for word, okay? And, and here's, here's what it was. I wasn't ready to leave until I wanted to stay. Otherwise, I would be fleeing and not following, right? Get it? I wasn't ready to leave until I wanted to stay. Otherwise, I would be fleeing and not following. If I had run out of there two years ago, I would have taken me with me. You know that feeling? And, and it wouldn't have worked. So, you know, I guess that's the first big lesson. I don't know if it pours into your life at all, but the first big lesson for me was something like this. I felt like I was just waiting. And, and it turns out that, that God was working the whole time. Amen. You know? And I, I couldn't see in the middle of it. Maybe, maybe that. So, yeah. So yeah, I give the word, it's euphoric. I had this step of faith to take, I took it. And the euphoria lasted about a week until reality set in. <laughs> and it gave way to two things. And it was very humbling and very fearful. Uh, the humbling part was, I really do think I thought if I ever left that place where I'd spent so much time, it would be because somebody was knocking on my door begging me to come please work for them. And that's not what happened. So now I'm having to pick up the phone and start calling people and say, hey, I'm kind of looking for what's next in life and don't really da da da, da. And, and you guys have probably all been there. And that was kind of humbling, right? And, and the second thing was I, I, I was, uh, I think, 58 years old at that time. Mm, that's a weird time to start a new career. <laughs> and I, I, got, I was fearful. I was fearful. And I'm laying in bed one night, and I'm kind of praying through uh, these things. And um, it's like God just pressed on my heart two things. Clear as a bell. And it was this. And this, in regard to the humbling, I want you to remember that you are not a king. You're a servant. So be done with the kingly expectation that you should be ushered in. And in regard to the fear, this is, this is what it means to, to belong to Jesus, right? You're, you're not a king, you're a servant. So be done with the kingly expectation that you should be ushered in. But the other side of it is, uh, you are, in regard to the fear, you are not an orphan. You, you are a child of God. And your heavenly Father is good and resourceful, and it works, so be done with the orphan-like fear. I'm going to tell you, those two things, you know, sometimes this is like identity. This is who a person is when they belong to Christ. And sometimes God uses this idea of identity to call us up. You're not a king, you're a servant. And sometimes he uses it to calm us down. You're not an orphan, you're a child of God. And those two things became like two rails that I could run on into the uncertainty of what's next, right? As long as I remember those two things, I could move into uncertainty with a pretty significant degree of peace. You know, if I forget that I'm not a king, I'm a servant, I was derailing into the ditch of entitlement. Surely I deserve better than this, whatever it was. And if I forget I'm not an orphan, I'm a child of God, I derail into the ditch of pity. Man, if I could stay on those two things. You know, it really became uh, rails uh, to run on. So, virtually concurrent with all of that, with that glob I just gave you. Uh, virtually concurrent with those things uh, is... What was Dwight mentioned uh, in the introduction? A conversation that he and Dave Ofke have about, hey, maybe there's a, there's a next season, something more or different to do uh, for Toolbox. 
And uh, it was about that time that, that I ran into to Dwight. Uh, as he told you, I'd known him since my a and days. And he said, when he, when, when this, I love the way things come back around. When Dwight introduced Toolbox to me, I, I'd been in, I think I'd been to one Toolbox lunch, but I didn't really know anything about it. But when he introduced it to me, he said, hey, think of it like Young Life for business guys. I'm like, oh, okay, I can, I can relate to that. That's good, right? He said, you need, you need to meet Dave Ofke. And so I go meet Dave, and God, it was amazing. You know, I meet this guy and these guys who are willing to leverage their time, energy, relationships, and money to help men move through the very kind of things that, that I've just been describing to you, move beyond success and into significance and Man, it, it, was, it was really an amazing thing. So, uh, so I, I guess that, that second lesson was, was the reality of, you know, when I'm going through something, gosh, I'm not just me. I'm not a king. I'm a servant. And, and I'm not an orphan. I'm a child of God. And uh, I really did feel like God was... This is another verse in the Bible that says, for such a time as this, you were raised up to this place. And, and I look back now, I just feel like, God was just, you know, like, working all this stuff. That's what shepherds do. I'm working something here. And, and then it gives me the, the incredible joy. One of my other defining moments in my life, March 2nd, 2020, is, is the day that I started to work uh, for, for Toolbox. You know, and I thought, wow, what a privilege to, to be a, a part of things like this and with guys like you. And so, in, in just a couple of minutes I have left, I, I just, I, I just want to kind of share the heartbeat and vision. Even, uh, and Paul mentioned some of it at, at the beginning, for sure, you know, of, of what can happen here downtown. But, but uh, you know, I, I have four things I'll just mention, and they won't, they won't take long. I'll make sure. Uh, the first thing is, I, I just said, I just had this vision. I, I, I think you guys have this vision of, Hundreds, this is the way I describe it in my mind, is, uh, hundreds of busy men, like yourselves, H- hundreds of busy men organizing their demanding schedules around toolbox downtown lunches because they get something here that they don't get anywhere else in their world. That it's like this, this oasis. I mean, you guys know, we live in an anxious age, right? We, we live in a time where... People, it's easy to lose hope. And I, I cannot imagine go through the throes of the things that I went through, even though they're not huge. I can't imagine going through the throes of the things that I went through, you know, uh, without uh, a sense that God was working in me and with me in it, you know? And I, I hate the thought of somebody else doing that. You know, there's a real famous Christian named Augustine who's got this famous quote that says, our hearts are restless until we find a rest in thee. And his restlessness is he was an indulgent wild man. Uh, he was trying to fill his restlessness that way until, until he came to faith in Jesus and it transformed him. You know? And there's this verse in, in the book of Jeremiah that where God's speaking. He says, you've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and you're digging for yourself wells that don't hold water. I can't, I can't stand the idea, guys out there, digging wells that don't hold water, you know? I mean, a, 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 a guy who's restless, who's digging a well that doesn't hold water, he doesn't look like a mess, I don't think. I think he's got this, like, driving, driving restlessness that oftentimes he can make him very successful and look successful, killing it, you know? I don't, I don't know. There's guys like that out there. I, I, boy, I hope those guys can find something here for the stories of guys like you, you know, that, uh, that answers the, the need of the moment. Paul mentioned this as, as well. This is the second thing on my list, kind of vision for Toolbox Ten. Of more and more men beginning to exercise the wisdom of the easy ask. God, it's so easy to invite a guy. Where's Tracy at, Trace? There, uh, uh, Trace Dietrich over there. He's like the invitation machine. I, I don't know. How many people, uh, well, let's put you on the spot a little bit. How many people were invited to a toolbox lunch by Tracy Dietrich? Anybody? He, he always has people here 
uh, except for today. <laughs> now, it, if there's things that we do that make it difficult to invite, you got to say something. Because we want it, to be, it want it to be easy for you to invite a, a colleague, a coworker, a friend in to find hope and traction. That's, that's it. Third thing, man, I, I'm hoping, and part of the reason that, that we kind of thought, oh, maybe it would be, be good for me, me to, to uh, talk today um, is that you know, a, a vision that God would raise up additional leaders uh, for downtown who actually office downtown. Yeah. Uh, can I ask another question? How many guys in the room today actually work downtown? He worked in the building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thanks. Yeah, but to, to have guys to, who, you know, I, I got this picture in my mind of a bunch of guys getting turfy, right? Like downtown's our spot, right? And, and we, we want to make downtown Houston different, you know, because what we're doing and that God would just raise up a group of guys who, who begin to craft and to plan. And, and, and what our current leaders do Man, they're so good. They underwrite these so that you can come in. And, you know, we never ask for money. It's because we have these guys who are, are host partners who make this happen. And we want more guys to, to, to enter in, in those ways and, and, to, and to be a part of it. And, and, uh, in fact, why don't we just say thank you to all the guys who do that. Uh, it's amazing that you guys do this. All right. And, and here, here's the, the final thing, and then I'm done. Uh, is that more and more guys, I don't know what your rhythm is, uh, but that more and more guys would move from uh, a once a month to a once a week. That, that if you don't currently have a place where you're getting some input, where you're gathering with some guys, you know, where, you, where you're, you're hearing something that's true and feeding you, that, uh, that you... That you will. And we can find a way, you know. Um, you know, Dwight, Dwight uh, is one of the best teachers, leaders uh, that I know of. And, and we've talked about trying to create a spot downtown where you can come once a week, just not, it won't be like this, but a place where you, we want more and more men to move from once a month to once a week because that's just how we grow and develop. We need, we need one another, right? So anyhow, uh, so so that that's that's kind of it. Uh, in just a second, I'm gonna ask Dwight if you just come and close this, okay? But uh, Paul also mentioned the QR code that does like, sends you a TikTok and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really, okay? But it does do a little bit more than what he mentioned because if 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 you're like, gosh, I want to be a part of this in one, any of any of these ways, if you click on that, it gives you opportunity to check a box, all right? That is. You know, maybe I, I tell you some about my relationship with God and the way that works. Maybe you're going, God, I would like to talk to somebody about my relationship with God. There's just, just a little box in there. You just check. We'll, we'll have coffee. Maybe me or maybe somebody, other guy in the room. We'll, we'll have coffee. We'll just talk about it. No big deal. I'm not going to corner you. All right? I'm not going to, you know, just talk. So if, if that's something that's for you, just click on that, check that box, and, and we'll get back to you. Another thing is, there's a box there that says, I love what you're doing with Tuox downtown. How can I help? You want, maybe you want to be a part of it. Maybe you want to be a part of, like, tell me how to invite people. You know, maybe that's what you want to do. Maybe you go, gosh, I want to help. I want to help make it happen in one way or another. Just check the box. We'll, we'll have a conversation. Find a way to get together, all right, uh, to make it happen. And so, you know, and the other thing is, if, if you're not currently on our list and you want to get information about upcoming events, um, let us know. I, I think it's funny that I get to be here today. I'm like, wow. Last month we had a guy who, an FBI informant. Did I ever say this? Yes. Oh, wow, that's scary. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> that, that's when you know it's time to stop, when you're into repeats. <laughs> Dwight, why don't you come close us, will you? Yeah. <laughs>